This program is brought to you by Emory University. Hi. Thank you, Todd and Dr. Wyans. I, I appreciate the invitation to be here. Uh, it's a real thrill for me to, uh, to come to an institution that has the pedigree uh, that Emory University enjoys. Uh, I hope you all recognize and appreciate the work that Todd's done in his 11 years here. It's really, really quite remarkable, and the reputation I value reputation and relationships, and I think Todd is a fine ambassador, one of the finest I know, and it's always been a pleasure to, to, to work with him. I'm going to talk, hopefully, informally a little bit tonight. Uh, I have prepared slides. I have some prepared remarks, which I, I really don't like to follow. But before I, I get into the talk, I just take one minute to say that in my role as, as a, a, a founding board member and a chairman of the Delaware Bio Association, so that's our state association, and I've spent eight years, I might be one of the few people that serves on two boards, the Pennsylvania Bio, which is actually a rather large association. Uh, Delaware Bio is only about six years old. Uh, one of the pleasures that I get to enjoy each year is to be part of awards nominating committees and to recognize the, the excellent work that's going on in our region, in our community. So when Todd said that I was coming here and I would be the speaker during your annual awards, it, it really, really is uh, meaningful to me. And I'm going to be thrilled to hear uh, the recipients uh, being acknowledged uh, in their awards tonight. So I, I applaud Emory for doing uh, an awards, an annual awards day. Unfortunately, in some places, there's not enough of that. So I'm really looking forward to, to this evening. Um, I guess I'm going to get to operate the, uh, the slides here. Well, you've already heard I'm married, and I hope that doesn't come as too much of a shock to, to folks. But uh, I, I, uh, I left the traditional wedding picture here as, uh, as this. And uh, I, I, I think you've probably all read a lot in the press about the pharma industry. And indeed, prior to the economic meltdown in 2000 and 2007, 2008, Everyone was talking about the wheels had fallen off the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, the future was extremely uncertain. And uh, coinciding with all that press was the economic meltdown. And the, we all know what happened to the banks after that. And all of a sudden, the pharmaceutical companies, which have been in, in business for quite a number of years, are simply not going away. What is happening, and I think what's exciting for everyone in this audience, uh, today, and I speak on behalf of not just AstraZeneca, but our, the entire pharma industry, is that this is an exciting time. We are uh, adapting our business model, and more than ever, uh, we are not reducing the spend on R&D. We're simply uh, adjusting where that spend takes place, and the great news for the folks in this audience today is a lot of that money is being redirected at academic institutions and medical institutions uh, to identify innovative science, uh, cutting edge science, and to work in partnership in shared risk and shared reward to bring innovative and breakthrough medicines uh, to, 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 uh, to treat unmet medical conditions and for the benefit of patients because that's really at the end of, at the end of our long days, that's what it's all about is, and, and I've really been privileged in my 34 years at AstraZeneca, I just started my 35th year, to be part of the development of some very important breakthrough products that not only made uh, money for the company but really dramatically improved the, the lives of patients. So you, you heard I'm from Mississippi. My father's born and raised in New Orleans, so I, I usually have a Philadelphia picture or a, uh, or a, uh, Phil, or, or a New Orleans uh, picture up here, but I, I wanted to customize my, uh, my, my talk so that uh, you all could appreciate it. Hardly a, a day goes by that you don't he read a headline about some multi-million dollar deal being signed. Uh, that's common on the sport pages, but it's becoming more common in the press that, that covers the life science and the biopharmaceutical industry. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, my next slide will, will point that out. Uh, my, uh, my other half 
is a big fan of the Real Housewives of Atlanta, and that's why I had to put that up there, you know, because he didn't know who Matt Ryan was. <laughs> uh, but I, I would love to have a slide that has Emory University's uh, uh, picture on that one day, and, and hopefully some positive things can come out of my, my attendance here today. But indeed, this is a typical blockbuster deal that a pharma company might announce, and that is a hundred million dollar five-year commitment to the area of translational medicine. This is particularly aimed at a cardiovascular space. AstraZeneca's R&D headquarters had been, had been uh, located in uh, Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, we still have our cardiovascular uh, research done in Gothenburg, Sweden. I actually have a slide later on to talk a little bit more about that, but that's a great, that's a great uh, headline to see. Um, in looking back over the, again, I mentioned I referenced the pedigree of, of, of Emory, and certainly you all know about the, the blockbuster drug that came out of uh, the laboratories here and the, and the great work that was done. Um, I like to acknowledge that oftentimes when you read about a drug being approved or a drug reach, reaching a certain milestone or affecting a, 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 a really disease-modifying drug affecting patients and populations, you, you often don't hear uh, the, the original uh, academic institution that was associated with it because there's such a long timeline, anywhere from 10 to 15 years. You can pick a number between 500 million and 1.5 billion uh, as the cost of research development and approval to get these drugs approved. Uh, but it's great to see that Autumn has undertaken uh, the, the archiving and collecting the stories around the origins of uh, products that have reached, uh, through partnerships with industry, have reached the commercialization stage. This is something I borrowed. This isn't too old of a list, but it is something I borrowed from Fierce Biotech. And it lists about the top 25 deals, I think the list is about a year old, of, uh, of some of the biggest deals that have taken place among, uh, among institutions. I'm, I'm very pleased that uh, even though it's alphabetical, AstraZeneca is up there with, uh, with three, uh, three uh, very large deals. And I can tell you two of those are still alive and very much productive. Uh, one, has, uh, one has met its, uh, its, its, um, its goals and no longer continues. Um, there's also uh, that other British pharmaceutical company has listed uh, their deals and then some of my peers from, uh, from Pfizer and, uh, and Sanofi and such. So that gives you an idea that, that this is not only taking place over the past couple of years, but this is what's happening today. Um, just a definition. So we talk about collaboration uh, between academia and industry, and we talk about strategic alliances. And uh, while I don't expect everybody to, to read them, I can sum it up very quickly. A collaboration tends to be between a single principal investigator around a specific project, and it, it generally has a life of a year or two uh, to reach uh, an endpoint, transfer the, uh, the knowledge, the information to your industry partner, and that's, that's that. Uh, a, a strategic alliance, again, these are, these are really becoming more common, are about much larger uh, amounts of money, much longer periods of time, so that there's the, the reassurance or the commitment to the academic investigator that the pharma is not going to change their mind a year after signing the collaboration and, and drop the program or move on to something else. Uh, and, and, but, but the biggest difference is a strategic alliance also involves a greater degree of alliance management, more interactivity between the partners uh, and to, the, to the extent that oftentimes postdocs uh, might be, our, 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 our scientists might float between the two institutions, an academic may go to the industry partner, an industry partner may send their uh, scientists to the academic partner. So they're much more, uh, much more engaged. Um, these are a handful of examples. So now, now I'm going to move into the, the bulk of the presentation. I, I don't expect uh, to cover every one of these in, uh, in great detail, but it's really meant to give you a high-level view and, and the message being creativity and novelty as you approach the, your alliances with your, with your corporate or industry partners. Um, this, I, th I think many of these messages will show uh, my, that, that I am trying to represent the pharma slash biotech industry, big biotech industry. And this is by no means meant, you know, selling AstraZeneca as the only the only partner. Because um, as we move through these, you'll see I'm I'm very pleased to highlight the creativity of of all the uh, the business development groups that work in in the industry. So 
without uh, reading each and every one of these, I just point out that uh, in the first one, uh, this is this is extremely novel concept that Merck has engaged in establishing new research institutes, and they're doing them. Uh, th this this one happens to be independent, not for profit organization. It's in the San Diego area, which is based on measuring size, it's one of the top two or three uh, clusters of biotech uh, activity in the country. Look at the third bullet point. Merck's going to provide $90 million over the next seven years and, uh, and, and to fund programs, and bring them to the preclinical proof of concept. Uh, an arm's length agreement, they can still receive funding. So I, I think this is just an amazing commitment, again, uh, we talk about co-location and kind of the next slide, the, the next, this, this leads into this slide about what Bayer is doing at, at University of California, San Francisco. And I think if there is a model among academic institutions, what Catherine has done at UCSFF and, and what that institution has done is probably certainly at the, high, at the higher end of performing institutions, uh, good, good to emulate some of what they do. But Bayer has established facilities in Mission Bay. Uh, talk about expensive real estate, uh, but uh, they they also um, have a similar challenge that, that AstraZeneca had, and that is that the bulk of our operations are in Sweden and the UK, though we have a very significant presence in Gaithersburg and, and, a, and a significant presence in Boston, but we have no West Coast uh, presence except through some manufacturing sites uh, at, at, at Metamune, uh, which is our biologics group. But, but having the proximity to the university and use, use, utilizing this uh, collaborator, uh, they, they expect, expect to bring in, again, postdocs and startups, providing the space for spin-outs and startup companies to, to be incubated uh, with, again, with an idea that they'll form those important relationships that will identify those companies working in spaces that Bayer is interested in. Uh, this is about multiple partners. It's uh, interesting. That used to be a that used to be a term. I'm sure you guys uh, dealt with around here. Uh, University of Washington uh, has an agreement uh, in, in with uh, multiple pharmaceutical partners who are working again in the area of um, drug transporters. This is um, drug metabolism, ADME, I think is the, the phrase that you may or may not be familiar with, absorption, metabolism, distribution, and excretion of drugs. Uh, you'll see that there are a number of consortiums and a number of uh, pre-competitive agreements in this space where industry is actually trying to become more efficient and, uh, and, and deal less with uh, the duplication of effort, the duplication of resources, and identify ways in which they can work together. Safety consortium, uh, safety biomarker consortium is another example of that. But um, the idea being that, uh, that they can work to understand uh, the, the drug transporters and the way that drugs are managed uh, you know, in the human body and share that information. Um, Yale uh, actively pursuing multiple partners. Uh, again, that other uh, British pharmaceutical giant, drug giant, uh, has a deal with uh, Yale. And I think, I'm sure, you know, uh, Todd and his team will struggle with, with these uh, challenges as well over, over time. And that is to be able to uh, ensure that they're able to work with multiple partners from uh, the biotech industry as well as the pharmaceutical industry to delineate the boundaries of those relationships. But it is important that you, that you have these multiple large partners uh, because uh, agreements do, uh, do come to an end after a, either a technical or scientific failure or because uh, the strategy can change. I, I'd like to point out the deal with Yale and of course, you know, this is one of Jan Soderstrom's, uh, I, I think, who runs, who has Todd's similar role at, at Yale, uh, and also a very good friend. I mean, this is a showcase uh, deal. Gilead was really looking to diversify their business uh, model in the area of research and development that they were into, looking out towards the future. And they chose uh, the, some of the cancer labs at Yale University uh, to really, uh, it's not exactly reinvent themselves, but to, to think about the future and where there were growth opportunities and to identify early stage cancer research that's taking place at a top tier institution. And, uh, and, and again, that's about changing 
the, the strategy of a major, very successful company and looking out uh, at length many years as to what we want to be, what's going to drive the growth of this company in the future. So you can imagine how much time and effort went into when identifying the right institution to work with, the right personalities and the right commitment between the principal investigators as well as the scientists in the company. This is one of the oldest examples of industry cooperating with academia, and I'm very, I, I really like to put it up there because it does show that we can work together alongside each other for a very long uh, time when the outcome and the output from the uh, collaboration is beneficial to all the players. And this was always known as the Dundee Consortium, and quite honestly, this when it was formed in 98, I mean, that's so far back in the history of technology transfer, uh, you can imagine what went into trying to find uh, a consortium agreement that all these different companies could agree to. Uh, but not only have, were they successful in doing that, you can see it, it resulted in 15 research teams uh, working at this institution. Uh, the, the funding is not uh, unsubstantial. It, it's, it's not the hundred million dollars that you, you might like to see, but it's a firm and also long-term commitment uh, to discovering new science around the area of, kina of, of, of kinases and the way they, and the disease pathways that, that, that can be modified uh, from those. This is a, a very uh, new trend. Some of you may be aware of it. If you're not, you need to pay attention to it. Getting uh, connected to foundations, disease uh, foundations, uh, venture philanthropy, and the foundations. This is becoming a unique model and it's starting to show some promise. I think you're probably aware of, uh, of some that have, that have already developed uh, uh, measures of success. Um, Vertex uh, in particular has, uh, has brought to, to, to market disease modifying drugs. Uh, through through foundation grants, but uh, we're part of the TB consortium. This is a global uh, problem. It's a global challenge. And yet, if you talk to any one of the players, it may not be the biggest uh, financial market in the U.S. Although you know there is a segment of the population that has to be treated, uh, it is a, it is a it is a serious concern in developing countries. And this is an approach that, uh, driven by uh, contributions from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, as well as from each of the pharmaceutical companies. And the, one of the main things that we're contributing besides money is we're, we're using our uh, substantial compound collections, again, to find, to try and find new, new uh, products that are, and, and, and make the treatment uh, regimen around TB uh, much shorter and much more effective. A word about I don't know how you feel about master agreements. Um, it's uh, it's it's not the sexiest thing in the world, but once you have an industry partner, you, great things can happen. Magic can happen. Uh, the scientists are talking. Uh, they bring other people into the picture, and before you know it, you've identified another project, another work stream, another area within the company that wants to collaborate with the university. Having some sort of umbrella agreement or master agreement where you still work out the, 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 the research plan and certain details, but if you have an overarching master agreement, it's well worth it. We have them with MD Anderson, and we have them with Sloan Kettering, and we actually have a clinical master agreement with the NIH. So uh, again, the, I alluded to sharing uh, compound collections. The Broad Institute uh, actually does have uh, one of their own compound collections. We are one of the major pharmaceutical companies that's still very much interested in the infection space. Uh, we've been working in that space for quite a, quite, quite a number of years, and, and indeed one of our most successful products was in licensed in, but we did all the development work for it. And so having 100,000 compounds uh, to tap uh, out. One of the things that industry is always looking for is more compounds and a diversity in their compound collection because we tend to accumulate those compounds from working on specific projects. So a lot of our three million compounds look a lot alike. So we're looking for diversity in compound collections to, to aim at, uh, again, an area where novel, novel structures are required such as infection. How am I doing on the time? 
Okay. So um, I, I really wasn't aware that uh, Todd and, and his group are, ha have substantial uh, assets and, and effort aimed in the neuroscience area. And this is the one where I, I really want to applaud your efforts because if we're going to bring new disease modifying agents uh, to the market, commercialize them successfully and treat the significant unmet, unmet need in this area, in particular stroke, Alzheimer's, and Parkinson's, those discoveries are probably going to have to come and emanate from academic institutions. Many of the big pharmaceutical companies are, and, and very few of the uh, biotech companies are doing work in this space anymore. At one time, uh, we, had one of the, we had one of the most effective, uh, we, we still have one of the most effective drugs for uh, bipolar and schizophrenia. Uh, it's come off patent. There's a long acting form that we're, we're still marketing that is still on, on patent. But we, in the intervening time in trying to come up with a follow-on therapeutic to that, we had one of the biggest and most spectacular failures in stroke along with many other people. It's a graveyard of, uh, of failure. And uh, we, we did a, what we thought was some very exciting science with uh, a small biotech company spun out of R.J. Reynolds working, you know, working with ni ni in the nicotinic uh, acid receptor space. We thought that was going to be a, a, a breakthrough target uh, in, in depression and potentially in, uh, in schizophrenia. That, that failed significantly. Uh, and dramatically in phase three. And those things really hurt. You swing for the fences. You're trying to identify novel sciences so that you can progress this. But unfortunately, what we found out is, is unlike cancer and immunotherapy, where there's just an explosion of new information and great science and great targets and pathways to work on, unfortunately, we're not seeing that in neuroscience. So what we do have, what we have done is we have created a virtual neuroscience group about 40 or so individuals, including scientists and business development people, and we're putting together our own uh, consortiums and our own uh, string of, of projects in which we can continue to feed the preclinical proof of concept of novel targets. Um, I think that's probably a good time for me to mention that, uh, to ta to, as I was saying to Todd and his team earlier, uh, the advent of biotechnology in, in, when it came of age in the early 90s and brought us monoclonal antibodies and the potential for gene therapy and, and all kinds of novel vaccines. Uh, with, with the advent of biotechnology and the, 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 the human genome and understanding uh, all these new, new targets was the fact that most of these targets were unvalidated. Uh, companies rushed to file patents and they didn't have utility associated with them. And what we found was with, with the novel targets came a, a high degree of risk and failure. So it's uh, not that we haven't had exciting, uh, exciting uh, breakthroughs in that space, but it, it also cost us a lot of very precious time and, and resources that the companies had, uh, had committed to that space. Again, just another example, uh, Bristol-Myers Squibb, a company that whom we've had uh, very good relationships with and strategic partnerships with. Uh, working with Vanderbilt again in the area of neuroscience uh, to, to discover breakthroughs. Uh, the MGLUR being an uninteresting pathway, but again, a lot of validation needed to identify exactly, exactly which MGLUR. Uh, I won't spend much time on this, but uh, uh, you know, J&J is a pretty large diversified uh, company. They have everything from over-the-counter devices and strictly ethical prescription drugs, just like we do. But um, natural products will continue to be a source of, of innovative uh, compounds, whether they be large molecule or small molecule. And, uh, and so you'll, you, you'll see deals like this. Uh, 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 th these tend to be very long-term uh, searches for, for novel compounds. So this is a little bit more about uh, AstraZeneca and the Karolinska Institute. So it's a joint research center in the cardiovascular and metabolic diseases. Uh, about 18 months ago, AstraZeneca uh, secured a new CEO, um, Pascal Sorio. He's from France. And he has taken a, a, a significant efforts to redirect uh, the company to focus on innovative science and technologies and return us to a science-based organization to uh, identify both early and, and mid-stage mid opportunities to, to augment our, our own internal pipeline. 
and indeed about 40% of our pipeline comes from uh, out from partners. Uh, about 40 per, about 40% uh, of our of those are biologics, and the remaining 60% or so are small molecule space. But uh, the center's aim is is to help uh, validate novel targets within this uh, cardiometabolic uh, disease area. Because we all know how many drugs there are to treat high blood pressure and cardiovascular disease. We have one of the most successful statins uh, that's on the market today, and we're very proud of that heritage. And uh, so our CEO has uh, anointed the cardiovascular metabolic disease area as one of the areas that we will continue to focus on significantly in the future. Just a word about personalized health care and biomarkers. This, this space is really uh, one of the areas of cutting science, cutting edge science, that industry is seeking uh, a lot of small partnerships around specific diagnosis, diagnostics, specific uh, um, biomarkers for disease. 70% of our pipeline either has a diagnostic or a biomarker associated with it. That's to help not just with commercialization, uh, should should the program be successful, but it's it's actually meant to make our uh, clinical trials more effective to identify that patient population that will respond to a particular drug intervention. Uh, the 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 era of personalized medicine is is here, and indeed, the if if if, if you look at one of the uh, commercial uh, uh, challenges that the industry focus is focused with now. It's not just about research, development, and approval, regulatory approval. It's now about getting on formularies, getting reimbursement for these products, some of which tend, especially if they're biologic, can be very expensive therapeutics. We've, we've, uh, we're working with the payers and the providers in formal contractual agreements to try and identify the ways that we can segment the pa patient population and ensure that patients are, the, who will respond to, to treatment are receiving the right treatments. It doesn't do anyone in, uh, any good for uh, insurance companies to pay for treatments in, in patients that don't respond to those treatments. So targeted therapeutics and personalized medicine is certainly going to be a growth area in the future. I, I, I hope you all know about this particular deal. This is the holy grail for the industry to identify within a top tier medical institution a product in oncology immunotherapy that's going to change uh, the face of uh, the way cancer is treated is rare and greatly uh, valued by industry and patient groups alike. Uh, this is breakthrough research in cancer immunotherapy, actually using HIV or a modified HIV uh, strain to, uh, to reinvigorate uh, a person's immune system to fight off uh, a hematological cancer. Since uh, this deal was announced, it, it represented a very significant upfront and a significant uh, commitment to development. But since this, is, this deal was done on the back of three patients receiving this breakthrough treatment, all salvage patients who had literally weeks to live, it's now been in 30 patients of whom 15 are in remission. There have been about seven uh, treatment failures. Uh, but to that kind of success is simply unheard of. And this is, this is a true breakthrough that you'll hear about both in the technical press as well as in the, in the commercial press or, or the popular press. Uh, it's, uh, it's not without its challenges. It is immunotherapy. Uh, it does have to take the cells out of the, the patient's body. They have to be manipulated and reinfused. But, uh, but this, is the, this is the future of what we think uh, will turn uh, many uh, forms of cancer into uh, chronic and manageable diseases as opposed to death sentences. Just another word about something uh, unique, and this, this kind of is a commercial for uh, my company, AstraZeneca and MedImmune. We, uh, we do have an abundance of uh, success in early clinical uh, projects. And like any company or any institution, we have limited development capabilities, limited budgets for conducting uh, 
uh, development or early development on an abundance of successful projects. So we have taken, these are IND ready uh, drug, uh, drug candidates and we have partnered with top tier inst medical institutions around the world of which there are about six uh, to date. Uh, and we have turned over the comp these, these development candidates in partnership to the medical institution to bring them to phase 2B proof of concept. We're very creative about the way we structure the deals. Uh, it's not focusing on the money aspect at this point, it's focusing on validating these drug candidates. Uh, when they reach that uh, point of uh, proof of concept, and I can tell you the one at the National University of Singapore is at that point, or near that point, uh, it, that was in hepatocellular car carcinoma. You can imagine that in, in that population, in that institution, they have a lot of experience with hepatitis B and hepatocellular carcinoma. That's why we chose them to do this, and they're conducting those studies. If they reach the point of concept, we can opt back in with a significant payment, continue to share the risk and share the rewards uh, if it's successful. Should our strategy change and we not be interested in pursuing uh, a successful candidate, we turn that over to the institution. They can find another development partner and we'll then receive a small royalty based on uh, any, any marketed products. But again, getting creative. This didn't exist in our industry before. We didn't turn over, we, we just shelved our projects. They just went on the shelf and they, they, they never saw the light of day. So this is a real, uh, uh, I think, creative way of saying, you know, we want to make the most out of, out of these assets. So this is, the, uh, this is just another slide that talks about how they went about it. There's 22 AstraZeneca compounds. This is the uh, Medical uh, Research Center in, in the UK, uh, 22 AZ compounds. Um, more than 100 cl clinical and preclinical proposals were received from 37 institutions. So you can see a lot of work goes into uh, orchestrating this type of, a, of an alliance. And, but that, that is representative of the commitment. And indeed, the, the MRC contributes funding. And there are, as you can see, there are 15 proposals funded across multiple disease areas. This is one that I have to admit I'm not as familiar with, but we often do have uh, we have uh, clinical stage candidates that don't progress for the uh, indication in which we were developing them, and, and drug repositioning is something that a lot of companies and are, are interested in these days. And I think this is just an example that we're open to that idea and that concept of, of re drug repositioning. Uh, I don't think there's uh, much else to point out there, but I have to thank Todd again. Todd. Uh, Todd, Todd gave me an award just about two weeks ago, and it was uh, really one of the high points of my career to, uh, to receive the Autumn President's Award. And so I uh, appreciate Todd's uh, involvement in, the, in selecting me as uh, the first industry re recipient of, of the Autumn President's Award. Um, just a short commercial about, I know budgets are tight, and I know it's challenging, but really one of the keys to finding and identifying industry partners is your ability to establish relationships with those entities long before you're negotiating a deal. You become uh, the preferred institution to, you get the first phone call, we get the first phone call when there's an opportunity. So we like to, to meet at partnering conferences. And I know you can't send an office of 20 people to bio, uh, you can't send 20 people to the autumn meeting. But more and more autumn has implemented uh, partnering as one of the mandates of, 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 besides just education at their annual meeting. And uh, I'm proud to say that I was instrumental in bio uh, adopting three years ago the academic pavilion. So we know that if you go to bio, oftentimes you're in your state pavilion, and that's and you're buried in there with a lot of uh, a lot of other in, uh, representatives that maybe get a little more attention than your 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 institution. You have the halo of the institution, but maybe it doesn't translate into deal opportunities. So we've established uh, acreage in the exhibit hall where. Uh, over, you can see the growth just from Boston in 2012 and 2013 is Chicago. Uh, over 500 one-on-one -on -one meetings taking place between academic institutions and, uh, and, and industry partners. We're giving uh, space for that to, to take place, bringing academics into the partnering process. The, the speed dating is basically what it is, but a lot comes out of that. And uh, when you see the numbers from uh, from San Diego, which is taking place in June, I think you'll probably up, be up closer to a uh, uh, thousand um, 
a thousand meetings and you'll probably have more like 400 or so uh, delegates participating. Uh, I'm going to, I'm just not going to spend a lot of time on this. This is more just about AstraZeneca and how our business development team, uh, we, are, we are basically one global group. Uh, as you heard Todd say, I'm the global head of external relations. Uh, for the group, it's my job to make sure that you get within one click of a mouse that your opportunity is in front of the right evaluation team and you don't spend a lot of time bouncing around within a very large organization trying to figure out who, who can actually tell you whether there's interest in working together or tell you what you would have to do in order to get us interested. We are the last commercial. We're a strictly ethical prescription drug company. We operate in small molecules and we operate in the biologic space. We don't do, we don't do, uh, we don't market over the counter products. We don't have devices. Uh, we are the only global biopharmaceutical company with this particular strategy. And we operate in these particular areas, cardiovascular metabolism, oncology, and respiratory. We also have a, a significant presence in infections, vaccines, and neuroscience. Again, opportunity-driven areas versus our core TA areas that we try to prioritize. A lot of times, and this is maybe more of interest to us to Todd's team, you know, why, why can't we get traction? Why are we not able to? Why is our opportunity, our technology disclosure not, you know, getting the right attention from, from our, any industry partner? I, I think this, I, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but it's just simple. It's, a lot of a lot of uh, individuals weigh in before uh, a deal gets consummated with a, a biotech partner or an academic partner, and you're really trying. And 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 even though something's at its the earliest stages in preclinical discovery, they still have to ask all these questions about it. And and what would that project yield? And you know what what's the best estimate of our ability to answer these questions and and direct a, a program at this. And uh, my fondness for horses, I think you mentioned that. Uh, it is a horse race, uh, and you're, I, I don't think it falls on deaf ears to say you're only as good as your last horse race or your last at bat. And, but I, I've just never been, I've been in this industry now 35 years, believe it or not, with the same company, even though we've changed names. I have never been more excited and more enthusiastic and more optimistic about the future. Uh, there are going to be a lot more collaborations between industry and academia. And I, I, I hope you've, in, you've learned something from my presentation. I'm going to be around for the rest of the reception. I can't wait to hear uh, the recipients of the awards. And I really, really appreciate the invitation to be here today. So thank you very much. And that's me. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.